let me once again welcome everybody officially to today's event, What XML Can Do For You, A Better Way to Share Criminal Justice Data. This event is sponsored by the National Institute of Justice and the Government Innovators Network. And I'd like to turn the event over to our moderator today, Deborah Daniels, a partner at Craig DeVault and the former Assistant Attorney General for the Office of Justice Program. Well, uh, thank you, Jim, and uh, welcome to everyone. We're delighted to have you joining us today for what we think is a very important discussion. Uh, we uh, want to thank the uh, Ash Institute at Harvard for uh, its uh, efforts in putting on a number of these programs, uh, but this is uh, uh, one of the most important, I think, for purposes of uh, law enforcement, the courts, and uh, many other players uh, in the justice system uh, who have a need to share information. We have really a quite a broad audience. We've uh, looked at uh, the information that you all submitted as you uh, uh, registered for this conference. And uh, we have people of varying backgrounds, varying levels of understanding of uh, both the global justice XML data model. And if uh, those of you less familiar hear us talking about GJXDM, that's what we're talking about. And, uh, and a few indicate an understanding of the National Information Exchange Model, uh, and you may have heard the term NEME for that, which builds on the successes and the foundation of the Global Justice XML Data Model. So it seems to me uh, that having glanced through uh, this list, we have government executives, we have IT professionals, we have project managers, professors, crime analysts, um, some are already conversant with XML and are looking for best practices. Some are in need of more basic information about XML. Uh, most uh, appear far less aware of NEAM, the National Information Exchange Model, uh, what role it plays, how it's related to XML, and what, is it, what it's intended to accomplish. But I think uh, to a person, our audience has expressed a desire to use whatever tools are available to help you share data on an immediate basis that is timely, accurate, and complete in a secure manner that respects privacy concerns. Um, I think that given our speakers today, uh, you have uh, certainly come to the right place. Uh, what, I'd, what I'd like to do uh, First, however, is maybe build on our knowledge of you and what you're looking for, what you know about this subject matter, what you're looking for uh, in this panel discussion, and that'll help our speakers respond to you. Uh, so Jim, I think uh, we were hoping to put up a couple of polling questions here, and can you take over and explain to people how to do this? Sure. Pretty easy. The displaying poll slide in front of you right now. If you can just click on the option that uh, that suits you, and uh, we'll have a few other polls to administer as well. If you see one pop up, you don't have to wait for a cue from the speaker. You can just select the option that is appropriate. So we may have all our responses now. We're still getting a couple in, I think. So uh, interestingly, it looks like we have a very high percentage of IT professionals uh, who may be in any or all of the other fields uh, and who probably are in at least one of these other fields as well. Uh, they're either in government, they're in the private sector, uh, uh, potentially uh, either in courts or law enforcement. Um, we have a, a small number of foreign officers uh, we have a few more government executives, you know, a few folks from the courts. As you can see, um, it's an interesting uh, division of our group, and we have a good number of folks uh, from the academic world. So, so that being said, uh, we kind of know uh, who's out there in our audience at this moment in time that we may add and we may uh, subtract as we go along. Uh, Jim, why don't we put up the second polling question uh, having to do with what you know about GJXDM or NEME? Are you currently using it, planning to use it? Never heard of either one of them? 
Uh, where are we on that? So at this point, we have uh, uh, just over 10% that are currently using uh, one or one or the other. I'm guessing a smaller, a very small percentage has moved to Neem at this point. Um, but a healthy percentage are planning to use it. And we have a lot of people who are going to want to have a, a pretty basic uh, education on just what it is we're talking about here. Uh, hopefully, we. Uh, we caught your attention with the fact that this is all about uh, better ways to share information electronically. And uh, so we want to help you learn more about how to do that. So uh, for our speakers, I'll suggest that we, um, we keep that in mind uh, going forward. Uh, and thanks for that, Jim. Let me uh, uh, mention. Uh, to begin with, our three speakers, and then what I'd like to do is introduce each of them uh, individually uh, for his uh, particular remarks. And uh, so our three speakers are Colonel Bart Johnson of the New York State Police, uh, Paul Embley of the National Center for State Courts, and Paul Wormley, the Executive Director of the IGIS Institute. Uh, and they represent a, a good broad background of uh, uh, places they come from and the perspectives they bring, but they also are all extremely knowledgeable about the subject matter uh, today from those different perspectives and have worked together uh, to help develop uh, the data model that we're going to talk about. Uh, so with that, uh, why don't we turn to our first speaker, uh, Colonel Bart Johnson. And Jim, I think you're going to put Colonel Johnson's bio up there so everybody can see what he looks like. There he is. Um, Colonel Johnson, and I won't uh, just read what you have on your screen. Let me tell you a little bit more about him. You can see that he's a 23-year veteran of the New York State Police Department with 30 years of experience in law enforcement. He began his career as a local police officer. Uh, in the city of Peekskill, New York. And uh, after some years there, entered the state police. He rose through the ranks. He was in charge of the New York State Police Special Investigations Unit, uh, responsible for traditional and non-traditional organized crime activities, narcotics, extensive use of electronic and physical surveillance. Uh, as he continued to move up in the ranks, he took over as statewide narcotics operations for the New York State Police. In uh, 2003, of course, as a result of the terrorist attacks of September 11th of 2001, the New York State Police formally established the Office of Counterterrorism. Uh, and at that time, Colonel Johnson, again being promoted to a new rank, uh, took over as the first head of that office uh, where he was responsible for uh, the counterterrorism missions of intelligence investigation and response initiatives. Uh, just earlier this year, he became deputy superintendent of the New York State Police and was placed in charge of field command. So he is now in charge of uh, essentially all these operations, the Bureau of Criminal Investigation, the Uniform Force, and the Office of Counterterrorism, as well as various special details of these units. Colonel Johnson has a Bachelor of Science degree in Business Management and Economics. And um, directly on point with our conversation today is the Vice Chair of the Global Justice Information Sharing Initiative and is the Chair of the Criminal Intelligence Coordinating Council. Uh, Colonel Johnson, I, I think we were hoping that you could share with us a little bit of background on the Global Justice Information Sharing Initiative and on the Criminal Intelligence Coordinating Council, uh, and your thoughts on the practical benefits that you've seen uh, from your point of view as a practitioner. Uh, thank you, and good afternoon, everybody. Um, I just first would like to thank uh, Mr. James Cooney and um, Ms. Deborah Daniels, um, and also the Kennedy School for Government 
for this opportunity really to provide an overview from my perspective is how important I believe all of this is. Uh, I speak purely from an operational uh, standpoint. Uh, you have two very talented individuals um, who are going to be following me, uh, Mr. Embley and also Mr. Wormley, uh, who I have the opportunity to work with quite intimately on a number of uh, issues to include uh, Global Justice, XML, and also uh, DEAM. So I look forward uh, to, for you to hear uh, their, their comments. Um, what I'd really like to do is uh, just talk about uh, really um, how we all got here today. I know how we got here today in the New York State Police and also myself personally. And it all harkens back to over six years ago now uh, when we were attacked uh, by the terrorists on September 11th in 2001. I think everybody here knows that there was a lot of studies, a lot of commissions, and a lot of new, new laws that came about uh, because of this attack and really um, has really forced us to work much closer together uh, in the exchange of information on a daily basis. And that's really what it's all about, uh, the exchange of information amongst the law enforcement uh, community. Uh, and this is just really one component of the community in which we're going to be dealing with, and I'll speak about it briefly. Um, in law enforcement, there's over 800,000 officers, 18,000 agencies who are out there uh, in the streets answering the domestics, uh, investigating the complaints. And they're literally the first line of the defense uh, to not only the prevention of terrorism, but certainly the reduction of part one crimes, uh, which is just as important as preventing terrorism. And what's good about this relationship is uh, the duality of the approach that the systems that are being built are not only going to benefit the prevention of terrorism, but also the reduction of crime. Um, and it, these individuals that also operate a number of records management systems, uh, they're starting to develop analysis systems, intelligence systems, and all these different systems need to talk to one another. And that's where uh, Global uh, came into play uh, through the, uh, the Department of Justice. Uh, oh, Johnson, I'm sorry. This is uh, Jim Cooney. I'm so, so sorry to interrupt you, but we're having a little bit of a technical problem. The text on some of the PowerPoint slides isn't displaying. So the graphics are appearing, but your text doesn't appear to the attendees. Okay. So um, I just wanted to alert you to that. You should still continue scrolling through them and using them as a guide. Okay. Just so you know that they can't see the text. Okay. We're trying to resolve that. Sure. Uh, by, by way of background, the Global Justice Information Sharing Initiative, it was established in 1998 uh, through the Department of Justice. And what this group is, um, it's an advisory body to the U.S. Uh, Attorney General on Justice Information Sharing uh, Initiatives. And over the years, they've developed a number of um, initiatives um, to include uh, Global Justice uh, XML. Um, we're designated as a Federal Advisory Committee Act. Um, we're composed of uh, key personnel uh, representing 31 local, state, tribal, federal, and international uh, justice uh, entities, uh, many of which um, represent and include uh, courts, corrections, probation, and also uh, parole. So it's really um, a great group of people um, who are at the table uh, being briefed up uh, by our federal uh, counterparts and really trying to address the issues and hopefully even solve some of the issues uh, that exist out there. Uh, the slide that I'm representing now, I don't know how this one's coming out, but really it's a, a breakout of the uh, members. Uh, you may uh, know some of them, some of the listeners out there, some of the people who uh, participate uh, with the Global Justice Information Sharing Initiative, and I encourage you uh, to uh, reach out to them uh, if you do know any of them. Um, some of the particular uh, groups that fall under a uh, global include the Global Intelligence Working Group and the Criminal Intelligence Coordinating Council, which really deal about uh, some of the intelligence-related uh, issues, the analysis, and also the uh, fusion, center, uh, fusion centers that are uh, standing up throughout the country. And I'll get to that in a moment. Uh, global privacy and information quality, because we need to make certain uh, that we're in tune uh, with the privacy uh, concerns and uh, keep ourselves uh, in line uh, with all the laws and also the information quality, uh, infrastructure and standards, uh, the security wo uh, working group, and the newly created uh, out, uh, outreach working group. I would encourage you to visit 
the uh, global uh, website that is available at www.it.ojp.gov. Uh, 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 it's a wealth of information. Uh, some of the information that uh, Mr. Warmly and uh, Mr. Embley are going to be talking about um, are also uh, contained uh, within this website. Uh, I mentioned uh, before about the Criminal Intelligence Coordinating Council and also the uh, Global Intelligence Working Group. And what they did over the years, uh, particularly since uh, 2002, was uh, uh, write the National Criminal Intelligence Sharing Plan. It was developed in 2003, and it was to uh, enhance the information sharing, the intelligence development, and the sharing capabilities post September 11th. Uh, it was formally endorsed uh, by the Attorney General and also the uh, Secretary for the uh, Department of Homeland Security along with a number of other local, state, and federal law enforcement agencies. And it has become the de facto standard for criminal intelligence sharing amongst law enforcement. Um, it's, in, it's mentioned uh, in the uh, information sharing environment implementation plan that was uh, signed off by the uh, President on November 16th of uh, 2006. Uh, it's the template for the uh, Homeland Security uh, information sharing strategy that was just released today by the uh, President, and I encourage you to locate that on the web. So at the state, local, and tribal level, uh, they played an integral role um, in the de development of capabilities for intelligence sharing. Uh, the next version of that process was the Fusion Center Guidelines, uh, where they make very, very uh, specific recommendations, 18 to be exact, that uh, incorporate MOUs, privacy, uh, security, uh, an advisory board, and really a roadmap uh, for now, I believe, over 52 intelligence centers that have been uh, stood up uh, throughout the country. Um, and it's a great document uh, to get your hands on. Uh, that, once again, is available uh, through the website uh, that I mentioned to you before. And it provides really a primer um, as to uh, what is going on uh, in the law enforcement uh, community. And keep in mind that community includes corrections, parole, probation, the courts, and even uh, private and public entities who uh, are responsible for the critical infrastructures uh, throughout the country. And really, the, the, the big takeaway uh, from all of this is that, uh, from my perspective, is that we need to share information. Um, it needs to minimize the compartmentalization of information. We need to get that shred of information, that shred of data that may be resident in an officer's notebook. We need to get that into a records management system. Then we need to build the capabilities to have that records management system fall into and build towards uh, index, national uh, data exchange, to keep that information moving across jurisdictional uh, boundaries. Because as I mentioned from the onset, um, that hopefully will be the one shred of information uh, that may help us solve a crime, uh, prevent a terrorist attack, or just uh, lock up a bad guy. Um, and it needs to be in that all-source approach. It needs to be all the criminal justice agencies. And I believe uh, NEEM um, is one big step in enabling um, all of us uh, to be able to accomplish that goal. Um, I'll take questions um, after, after, uh, after uh, when the time uh, approaches. And I appreciate, once again, the Kennedy School for Government for this opportunity. Thanks very much, uh, Colonel Johnson. This is a very useful background just to get people to uh, kind of how, how we got here. And it's all about the sharing of information, uh, not only getting people willing and agencies willing to share information, but then figuring out how to do it with all these disparate systems that they bring to bear on the problem. Uh, I now want to introduce our second speaker, uh, Paul Embley. Uh, Paul Embley is the Chief Information Officer and Director of Technology for the National Center for State Courts. He has 23 years of experience in which he has focused on managing both private sector and government uh, IT projects. Uh, and as I said, he is now Chief Information Officer for the National Center for State Courts. So as you'll see, we have law enforcement and the courts represented as well as the private sector. He has served over the years as a resource to many national and international agencies on standards and on information sharing. 
uh, and particularly uh, has advised on the development of the National Information Exchange Model and has served as an advisor to many of these NEEM groups as well as chair of technical committees involved with both NEEM and Global, and that is the NEEM Business Architecture Committee, the Global Justice XML Task Force, which preceded it, and the Global Justice Training and Technical Assistance Committee, as well as the Management and Policy Committee for the Infrastructure and Standards Working Group of Global. And um, Paul, I think uh, what, uh, what, what we'd like you to do first is tell us what some of this means, in other words, uh, tell us something about the, the work of the original task force that developed XML, and perhaps you can create the link for us between XML and uh, NEEM, if that's part of your uh, prepared remarks, or, uh, or at least in the question and answer session later, because I know we're going to want to link that up for people. Well, thank you, uh, Deborah. Um, I wanted to start out by thanking uh, Deborah. She has been a great supporter of this effort. Uh, uh, not only during the time that she was uh, the Deputy Attorney General, but uh, even now she continues to support us and uh, is a great resource. And then also I need to remember my friends at uh, BJA, uh, the Bureau of Justice Assistance. Um, they are um, uh, have been long-term supporters, and uh, since they're on uh, the the call, I think that I probably need to recognize them so that hopefully the courts can still get more money. But uh, <laughs> and I'll <laughs> join you in recognizing my old friends from BJA. <laughs> yeah. um, I also noticed that uh, um, of those represented, only about three percent are from the courts. So I think that cuts down on the amount of time that I can uh, uh, pontificate. So. Um, uh, Deborah um, used a number of different uh, committees and uh, um, acronyms in, as she described uh, what it is that I've been involved in. XML was invented oh, back in the 1990s as a way uh, for businesses to be able to exchange information. Uh, they, um, I know that most of you know that uh, the world runs on uh, you know the exchange of information. Banking uh, is obviously a, a big um, uh, user of uh, information exchange. Uh, automotive in industry uses uh, quite a bit uh, through uh, purchase orders. And so uh, in the search for how can we do exchanges better, um, uh, XML was invented. And uh, uh, in the late 90s uh, and early 2000s, uh, we um, in the uh, justice community started taking a look at XML, and uh, which stands for Extensible Markup Language, uh, started taking a look at that and saying, boy, we could use this as well because we uh, want to exchange information. And so uh, we uh, took a scan of the landscape, noticed that uh, Several of our groups were starting to use XML and decided that uh, instead of uh, keeping it an individual group thing, uh, we went to uh, BJA and got their sponsorship and were able to uh, bring those various XML efforts together and um, uh, be able to implement that. Well, so what does all this mean to a, a, a layperson? Uh, I did integrated justice at the Commonwealth of Kentucky. And when uh, I tried to explain this to my governor, um, he said, a uh, light went on, and he said, well, what you're saying is this is just like the railroads, where um, in the early days of the railroads, they had different widths in the tracks. And you would uh, drive to the end of the line, and you would have to unload all the cars, and you would have to put it back, uh, put it onto a other cars so that they could travel through a different state uh, and then uh, they would end up offloading things on their at their border because uh, all the the gauges were different and I said yeah and he said so what you're trying to do is you're trying to make the same gauge throughout the entire nation and so really what we're trying to do with XML is is make it so that all information can travel uh, this same railroad and be able to connect up and not have to uh, do uh, a whole bunch of offloading of the data onto a different uh, carrier and be able to take it across. So 
Um, maybe that's a little simplistic, but uh, hopefully that can help people out. The, um, the work that we did was uh, through the XML Structure Task Force um, that had a number of representatives on it from courts, corrections, law enforcement. And then what we did was we uh, took that uh, concept and said, well, um, here in the courts we want to talk to Health and Human Services. We want to talk to um, uh, 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 you no know, drug courts, and we want to talk to transportation uh, whenever we um, uh, uh, do something with a driving record. You know, we suspend a license because of a DUI. Then uh, we want to be able to talk to to our our local DMV so that that uh, record can be um, notated, and uh, so that uh, anybody looking at that record can know that that license has been suspended. And so. So when we started to look around at other communities that beyond criminal justice, we said, well, we need to take this further, and that's uh, how uh, NEEM uh, came to be. Uh, it is, as, De as Deborah said, it is based on the GJXDM, but uh, we believe that we've uh, taken a lot of the issues that existed with the GJXDM, corrected those, and hopefully uh, made uh, NEEM that much better. And I believe with that, um, Paul Wormley was going to take over. Sure. Let me uh, uh, let me just uh, for for clarification for that large uh, group of folks who didn't know much about either of these. So you developed GJXDM, which is the the data model, the the gauge on which all information can pass, right? And then for, for criminal for criminal justice, criminal justice data, um, and then. Um, walk us through that transition to NEEM again, um, just briefly. Uh, how did how did uh, uh, people come to the decision that they needed to move to uh, this uh, broader thing? Was it really more of a marriage with Homeland Security? Uh, but you said you also solved some problems with it. Well, and 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 that's a really good point, Deborah. Um, the, the way it started out was it started out with us, uh, D DHS was in its infancy and uh, we, we knew that they were going to be coming out with standards and we were very concerned that uh, Department of Justice and, and uh, Department of Homeland Security, if they were not aligned, that uh, we could end up really confusing uh, the, the nation uh, uh, as far as what we were coming up with. At the same time, we looked out there and we said, there are a number of others who are doing XML and doing XML standards. And they are at different um, uh, points in their progression. But we wanted to really step out and say, can we bring these people together? Can we influence where we go with this and, and uh, form uh, some partnerships? Uh, DHS, to their credit, uh, stepped up to the plate and said, um, we, we don't have pride of ownership and so we are willing to uh, take a good effort and uh, to uh, apply some resources to it and make it even better. And so a partnership was formed in February of 2005, I want to say, or 2004, one of those two years. <laughs> Um, a, a strong partnership between DHS and Department of Justice, and uh, uh, we uh, at that point announced NEEM. Uh, we are still working with uh, transportation uh, uh, to see uh, where they fit into the picture. Uh, I know from the court's perspective, uh, we've uh, worked with them and, and uh, would really like to see them be part of the NEEM effort. Uh, uh, Health and Human Services, as I mentioned, is working with the courts, and uh, we are bringing them to the table as well. That's great and very helpful. Um, I do think that the uh, period of time, uh, really from the time that DHS was created in 2003 through 2004, uh, Global really reached out to, uh, along with Justice, uh, to uh, Homeland Security. And uh, I think you were able to announce in early 2005 uh, the uh, 
development of NEEM, if I recall. And our next speaker, Paul Warmelay, will be able to correct any uh, imperfections in our memories, because he's been working on these issues for a long time. Uh, Paul Warmelay, uh, whose bio is now before you, uh, is Executive Director of the Integrated Justice Information Systems Institute, known fondly uh, to its friends as the IGIS Institute. Uh, it's a nonprofit corporation formed to help state and local governments develop ways to share information among the disciplines engaged not only in public safety and justice, but also uh, homeland security. Uh, Paul was actually uh, not only the first national project director of Project Search, which uh, appears in the bio that you see, he was also uh, deputy administrator of LEAA, the Law Enforcement uh, Assistance Administration, which was a precursor to the Office of Justice Programs uh, at the Department of Justice. Uh, so he's been working on these issues for many years. He has uh, uh, founded three private companies. He has been an advisor to government over the years, helped design actually the first mobile computing equipment sold to law enforcement agencies in the country, um, has been an advisor to the White House on security and privacy issues. Uh, was uh, the first chairman of a consortium of companies, over 100 companies, uh, formed in 1999 uh, to bring the uh, private sector into this whole planning process. It was called the Integrated Justice Information Systems Industry Working Group, otherwise known as the IWG. Uh, Paul brought that group together at the specific request of the Department of Justice. Um, to help with this implementation of integrated justice information systems uh, throughout the country. He currently serves as chairman of the NEEM Communications and Outreach Committee. He is also chairman of the Executive Steering Committee of the GJXDM Training and Technical Assistance Committee, and uh, has served as a technical advisor for the Harvard School of Government Innovators Network Program. He. Uh, obviously has done a great deal both in the area of developing uh, police records management software, in-car computing, the sorts of things that are so critical to law enforcement, but also in bringing the private sector into a cooperative uh, relationship with law enforcement and homeland security. Uh, so we're delighted to have Paul Wormley with us as well to round out our extremely distinguished uh, panel of speakers. Uh, and Paul, I think we were uh, hoping that you could talk to us a little bit about uh, some of this background as well, and also the role of the private sector in these fields. Sure. Thank you very much, Deborah. I'm delighted to be here, and I want to thank you and the Kennedy School of Government for hosting this program. I think we need to do more things like this to help people understand the power of these new tools. <clears throat> and I'm delighted we have such an interesting audience listening to us today. Um, I, th I think this evolution of uh, creating standards for first the law enforcement and justice communities and then ultimately additional communities of interest uh, is a, a very special thing in the annals of government history. It's one of the first times in, in my years in this field that I've seen two federal agencies uh, reach out to state and local practitioners and to industry to foster the kind of collaborative effort that would define a way to facilitate the exchange of information among uh, communities of interest. And uh, I think uh, Deborah's reign at OJP was, was one of the highlights of support for uh, doing this with the, the work that BJA, uh, Bureau of Justice Assistance, which is a part of the Office of Justice Programs, has done. Domingo Jerez has been a strong supporter. Uh, of this entire program and has really uh, engaged all of their various partners, including the IGIS Institute and, and SEARCH and the National Center and others to help uh, agencies at the federal, state, and local level understand this model and how to apply it. Uh, the, uh, the Department of Justice and particularly the Office of Justice program some years ago uh, when they began to attack this problem of information sharing, realized that uh, industry, and particularly the information technology industry, could help 
uh, with some of the policy issues as well as technical issues to solve this national problem of information sharing. And then they reached out to industry. And we've had representatives from the IGES Institute uh, serve on the various committees, including the committees that Paul Embley's talked about, the XSTF and the uh, NEAM Business Architecture Committee, Technical Architecture Committees, to uh, be there as technical resources, and, and also many of the subcommittees that uh, Colonel Johnson talked about uh, related to the global project. So industry has been at the table. In fact, this partnership between the public sector and private sector recently won an award at the Annual Excellence in Government Award for you know, being one of the premier collaborative structures like this uh, that's ever been brought into being. And we now have 225 companies who provide volunteers to serve on a lot of these committees without compensation. Uh, last year we had over 250 people from industry who, who gave their time and, and uh, effort and finances to support this effort. So it's been a, a true public-private partnership and a federal, state, and local partnership that is, I think, uh, never been created before in the history of, of government. So I'm very proud to be a part of it and, and thrilled with the progress we've made. I think what, going back a little bit to this transition that you asked about, Deborah, that once the uh, the CIOs of the Department of Departments of Justice and Homeland Security signed that memorandum of agreement in February 2005. Uh, it set off an entire process to try to define what were the communities of interest that really needed to exchange information most. And it began not only starting with law enforcement and justice, but looking at the intelligence community, emergency man medical systems, services, the disaster management, uh, even um, some aspects of international trade are now represented in, in NEAM. And it truly was a way to uh, create a governance process as well as a data model that would allow, uh, uh, facilitate information sharing across those multiple domains. And that, that was the, the beauty of the idea. So NEAM itself really consists of some some common or core data elements that are of use to everyone, either all domains or in some cases multiple domains, and then specific areas that are spe where the data is linked to a specific domain. The justice domain in NEAM now is really what used to be the, the GGXDM, so nothing's been lost. Uh, what, what happened is we went from about 2,500 data components to I think it's over 5,000 now, Paul, is that, correct me if I'm wrong on that, but uh, we've really expanded the, the data content and improved the structure so it can be the basic building block for facilitating exchanges across multiple domains. And then the, another key part of this uh, for the IT people that are listening is that this is really a, an object-oriented model that's built uh, without relying on XML. It uses XML, and that's what we all know today, but it anticipates the potential of uh, growing into new technologies like the semantic web and the other uh, technologies that might come along later. So it, it's, it's driven by business rules, not by technology rules. And it builds on all the other standards that, that Paul mentioned that it started perhaps in the commercial world when the computer companies finally got it through their heads that they had to talk to each other's systems. And, and the standards were developed, and we, NEAM uses all those standards. It also uses the standards familiar to us in law enforcement and justice. Now, one of the incredible things about NEAM is it incorporates references to all of the FBI code tables that the FBI has agreed to maintain and make part of NEAM. And, and also, uh, namespaces from other authoritative sources like the Postal Service, and, and it follows international standards for how do you how do you name data components, and uh, so it's it's really a standard built on other standards, and and all of the aspects of the the World Wide Web that have resulted in open standards are represented in in the way NEAM has been put to work. 
I wanted to talk just a little bit about you know kind of where this is now because I think it's important. I expect some of you wonder uh, what the, what's going on with this program, and are we just you know talking about a, uh, selling you smoke today, or is this real? And I, I think what's amazing to me is that there's been an unbelievably rapid adoption of of Neem as a the framework for information sharing. Uh, we only the, the first real ready for production release of Neem just came in the end of July. That's version 2.0 of of the Neem data model, and a lot of activities are going on at the federal level. Uh, all of the Department of Justice programs uh, have adopted Neem as the basis for. Uh, developing their, those information exchanges. Uh, perhaps most importantly, the FBI has just declared that uh, NEEM will be used as the basis for the new National Data Exchange Program that's being developed. And they've actually published uh, what we call an information exchange package documentation on um, for this index program that's, that's built fully on NEEM 2.0. So in the next couple of years, that's going to be rolled out as the national way of exchanging information between police agencies on, on incidents. A uh, very important move forward. Uh, within the FBI, they're using NEEM to uh, create uh, to all exchanges that relate to things, programs like the Sentinel program, which is really a case management system in the federal government. And the advisory policy board for the FBI has really uh, advocated that the FBI move the entire National Crime Information Center information exchange program to NEEM. So uh, this this program has enormous support at the uh, at the federal level in the Justice Department, and even in in the Department of Homeland Security, um, there are now about 38 different projects underway to adopt a NEEM and use NEEM as a basis for information exchanges. But one of the most uh, interesting things about it is the state and local adoption and use is just uh, absolutely moving like wildfire through the country. We have at least uh, seven or eight states who have committed already to making NEEM the basis for all of their law enforcement and criminal justice exchanges, but also adding other domains like transportation. New York is uh, committed to using NEEM for everything they're doing and building a new portal for statewide access to criminal justice information. Florida has uh, adopted NEEM to uh, build their new statewide uh, law enforcement information exchange program, including the feeding data to the fusion centers. Um, Colonel Johnson's home organization, the New York State Police, is itself creating 40 different exchanges to, designed around NEEM. Pennsylvania is moving towards upgrading its installed JNET system to make it compliant and conformant with NEEM. Texas has undertaken a, national, a statewide plan for adopting NEEM for everything it's doing. Maryland is looking at uh, heavily at other domains as well, including transportation centers and public safety. Uh, and on and on and on. Very shortly, there'll be a new criminal history, uh, computerized criminal history report, rap sheet, that will be NEEM compliant and will be used by inlets and, and all states in exchanging criminal history information. And then you can even get down to the local level. Uh, Fairfax County, Virginia has actually implemented as part of the uh, national capital region a, uh, a basis for information exchanges about resource availability across all 19 jurisdictions in the national capital region using NEEM as a basis. There's a project going on right now in Houston with their transportation agency to uh, develop a NEEM 2.0 based exchange to, for exchanging data between transportation dispatch centers and public safety dispatch centers. Hawaii is uh, working on juvenile justice. Uh, Ohio's building uh, building off their existing very powerful system where today using GGXDM and soon using NEEM, uh, any police department in Ohio can search the records management systems of any other 
participating agency. They've got 700 police departments now sharing data through the use of GDXDM. It's an unbelievable capability that didn't exist just a couple of years ago. Uh, we we're also seeing in the fusion centers so throughout the country using NEEM as a basis for um, exchanging information not only between local agencies in in the fusion centers, but between fusion centers themselves. So uh, we're really making enormous progress in this in the adoption and use of of all of these things. Um, there's a lot of new IEPDs that are that have been created and are out there available for people to use as a reference point to get started. The, we've got the court information, the exchange package documentation, that uh, and sentencing orders and court performance measures and uh, law enforcement incident reports and arrests and interchanges between transportation and public safety and computer-aided dispatch uh, exchanges, prosecutor-originated exchanges. Uh, and a whole lot of others being developed, and they're available in a clearinghouse that anybody can get to and use as a reference. And Paul, you mentioned that the courts are doing through the National Center some extensions out to even to other communities of interest, right? Uh, that's correct. Uh, we are uh, working quite heavily on child welfare um, due to uh, the synergies between uh, Health and Human Services and the courts, and just trying to um, get that nailed down. We anticipate that we'll have uh, um, at least the first of our IAPDs by the end of this year. And does one of you want to explain uh, the term IEPD, which I know stands for Information Exchange Package Design, but that's about as far as I go. Well, it's really just a, co a collection of artifacts about an exchange, starting with the business rule and the, and the purpose of the exchange and the rules governing the exchange, and then continuing on to map the what are the data elements needed for that exchange, how do they map to the NEEM uh, data model, and then uh, including a reference XML schema that says here is, here is the uh, uh, an instance of, of an exchange with all the data filled in and uh, it's a schema that people can take and use to build those exchanges. And there's a, a website which is now in front of you that the IEPD Clearinghouse where you can actually go and search uh, the Clearinghouse and then find uh, uh, IEPDs that interest you or submit your own new ones to keep the rest of the community aware of what you're doing. And it's very easy to very intuitive to look at all the ones I think I saw sliding by that we have 89 different uh, IEPDs already there. And, and that's on the same website that was already mentioned, it.ojp.gov. That's right. And it's, but you, it's an interesting thing. If you just go into Google and type IEPD, first thing you'll get is a link to that website. Good. Um, maybe I, uh, yeah, I see. Maybe I could pose a question to uh, really both of you, I guess, because you've talked a little about this. We, we've gotten a question uh, already from one of our participants saying that I've heard some about NEEM and the global uh, justice data model, um, but I can't. Uh, I can't tell exactly what it is. I don't have a conceptual vision of what it is. Um, and is there anything you can provide, whether it's a, a diagram or something else, uh, that would assist? I think that, uh, Paul Wormley, you had a slide um, that, uh, let's see, as I look at I think your slide three, at least, was uh, a little bit of a conceptual uh, description of what it will do for for organizations. Um, forwarding incident and arrest data from police to prosecutors, you know, and a number of other things like that. Yeah. Um, and uh, that may help people understand just what it accomplishes. And I think, you know, without getting too technical, uh, essentially you're identifying basically fields 
and so that in every one of these disparate systems it will recognize you know name of perpetrator you know from a pure lay standpoint here's my description you know recognize name of perpetrator recognize date of incident recognize different things no matter in what format the system uh, provides that and yeah, I can you explain that a little bit better so that people understand that the sorts of uses that this can uh, uh, assist with? Sure. If if you think of it as a translator, uh, what, however you represent data in your own computer system, if you have last name being represented by, you know, L name, and someone else has a system that represents last name as as L A S T name. Well, those computers are too dumb to know how to figure that out without some common ground in the middle to make translation. So what NEAM, the data model part of NEAM, is, is the getting agreement amongst all of these communities on one single way to show what, how we're going to represent last name, first name, address, et cetera. And once you do that, then it's very relatively easy and far more cost effective to use that common standard in between the two computers. So if my computer says has it in one way and yours has it in a different way, if we both convert it to a common standard, then our two computers can be told how to read that and, and store it without human interaction. So what the bottom line is, uh, without trying to get, again, too simplistic in this analogy, is that if you're building an interface to from system A to system B, in, in the old days, we had to write extensive programs to write a lot of code to make these interfaces happen. And they, they had to be done every time over and over again for each, each possible interface. If everybody used the standard and converted to it, then any other new computer system that comes along that knows what the standard is can read that data. Uh, and that's the, the beauty of XML is that it's an open standard, but it requires this data dictionary, 5,000 different data components, data elements that we want to have, and uh, common agreement on what they are. The bottom line from a, from a financial perspective is people that have implemented GGXDM, and we have a lot of evidence of this, have cut their cost of building these Inter what we used to be called interfaces, we now more accurately call information exchanges, cut the cost by 50 to 75 percent over and over again. Now what does that, that means that we can do a lot more information sharing we could never do before because of the high cost of building interfaces, but we, we can also save a lot of money in, in, in any given implementation. So we can do things like this slide suggests of uh, forward incident and arrest data from police to prosecutors without requiring the prosecutor to sit there and re-enter the data, which is the most labor-intensive and expensive way to do it. Well, uh, from an emergency management standpoint, uh, your next point on that slide, determining the status of beds, staff, and resources at hospitals, you're suggesting that you know if uh, if this is built into uh, where all the all the hospitals in a community um, agree. Uh, to use NEAM for purposes of keeping track of their own uh, bed staff resources, then emergency management can key in, and when they need to know where to send people in an emergency, in a crisis, um, they'll have that information at their fingertips? Right. Now the, uh, sitting in the, uh, in the ambulance in, in Washington, D.C. area, they're equipping all ambulances with mobile computers, and they'll be able to in, their, in the ambulance as soon as they picked up the patient to say, where are the empty beds in surgery? Uh, they're, they're even talking about, you know, who has different quantities of blood available? And then take the patient directly to where there's resources available as opposed to what happens now is they end up making phone calls or the dispatcher makes phone calls and say, who's got a bed? And you can see in some of the major disasters around this area alone that uh, the confusion over where to take patients it can be just not only extremely confusing but life threatening so yeah that's if if they agree to use this common language in the middle to uh, convert data to and from different computers 
then you solve a huge number of problems and save a lot of money in the process. Let me uh, suggest, thank you, Paul. Uh, th that's very helpful. I think we're, we're kind of getting a handle for uh, all of the lay people out here, which include me, I might add, um, on you know exactly what we're talking about here and the, and the incredible potential that it has, and frankly, the fact that we cannot be efficient without it. Um, we we had another polling question. We just want to make sure our audience is still uh, still awake out there. And so I thought maybe we could go back to Jim for a second and. Uh, See if he could put up this polling question that will help us in the ongoing question answer session perhaps um, deal with what your hopes are from this uh, effort. So here we go. So after this call, your plans are to find out more about NEEM, request some technical assistance, and we'll get to that in the Q&A, by the way, um, where that comes from, um, and, the, and the other things. Uh, I think the wait to see where this winds up is kind of your catch-all. If you're just really not sure, I suppose that's what you're going to check. Um, uh, but please tell us uh, where you think you're, uh, where you think you fall in that continuum. And I see that uh, um, we have a good portion of people that just want to find out more about Neem. Um, we're going to, a lot of people are going to talk in-house about how this could be effective for you. And perhaps that couples up, quite frankly, with some of the technical assistance. Um, and I'll ask folks about that. Um, and it looks like not even that many people yet are ready to even think about funding. Um, you're still thinking, I think it's safe to say to our audience, uh, about you know, how do we wrap our minds around what NEEM is, what it can do, how we can use it in our environment. So maybe we can focus on that uh, for right now in our question and answer. Um, thanks for that, Jim. That's very helpful. Um, so if we, if we could uh, get into some of these questions, um, well, one of the things is, is I've been reviewing information about NEEM more broadly is that it does appear um, that people can get more information about NEEM um, and that uh, it includes sort of a governance and technical assistance component uh, that we didn't have before. Can anybody speak to that? Well, yeah, I, I think both Paul and I can. The, <clears throat> the, uh, the Bureau of Justice Assistance has been really outstanding in supporting creating training and technical assistance capabilities through various partners, including the IGES Institute and the National Center for State Courts and SEARCH. And uh, there is there are a lot of resources out there uh, funded by BJA to provide technical assistance and training. The IGES Institute is coordinating a very heavy round of, of training efforts uh, to teach people on how to build IEPDs and how to implement NEEM. Uh, we do presentations at, at conferences of, of all kinds from you know practitioner conferences like IACP and the Recent court technology conference, we uh, do. Uh, we send teams of industry out to do technical assistance from the IGES Institute in a company neutral and technology neutral way. So, all, all paid for by the Bureau of Justice Assistance. Uh, and you know, you can find more about that at the technical assistance section on our website, www.ijis.org. Uh, you could find out about the training and, and a whole lot more about NEEM at the uh, primary NEEM website, which is www.neem.gov, and you can access the training schedule and, and a whole lot of good materials that will help, help you do your homework on what it is. And that there's also a concept of operations that describes the governance process and. The governance process, since you mentioned it, Deborah, is, is very, very extensively developed to ensure that there's representation by all the communities of interest in every decision that's made about the data model and, and how it's used. Um, any other comments on that uh, from any of our other panelists? Um, one, one thing that I would also mention is that uh, we're continually looking at innovative ways to deliver um, uh, information to people. And one of the things that we're 
pursuing uh, and hope to have by uh, ready by the beginning of next year is um, uh, some distance learning uh, courses so that we can actually uh, allow people to go online and uh, actually receive training and uh, be able to uh, avoid having to take a week out of their schedule and fly somewhere and uh, you know, not um, have the training uh, apply or, or be delivered in their office. So uh, we're we're continuing to look at uh, uh, ways of doing uh, technical assistance and training uh, using innovative ways. Yeah, that'll be very helpful in these days of tight budgets and busy schedules. Uh, Colonel Johnson, you have anything to add on on you know how people can learn more about uh, some of this and how it applies to them? Um, I believe enough websites have been given out on how to learn, but I can certainly comment on how it can apply uh, with uh, obviously uh, law enforcement, uh, private industry, the courts, and corrections. Uh, it's just going to enable uh, information sharing um, to really excel. And just imagine that a, a street officer uh, makes a suspicious observation of, a, of an incident or an occurrence in a, a state in New York, let's say, and he calls uh, the terrorism tips line and it's received at a fusion center. It's documented into an intelligence system that a lot of these fusion centers are building. And the importance of having the ability to reach out to the disparate records management systems that exist out there, and I couldn't even begin to identify the countless systems that have already been built or underway. And it's just gratifying to know that there is a, a solution to a lot of this in the form of NEEM to standardize that handshake, for lack of a better word, to pass that information uh, amongst the state and locals and equally important at the federal level, uh, the federal government. So I think that's a real utility of it, to be able to share information in a very efficient and timely manner based on the business practices that are being built around them. Thanks. We might follow up. We had uh, one, one of our uh, audience members had asked, um, based on his knowledge of the PDF format that uh, you know everyone uses to scan documents into a PDF format so that they can exchange them electronically, um, and what's the difference between that and XML? And I, I think if you know, again, um, a, a basic understanding of what we're talking about in terms of sharing not just documents, but um, the information that agencies have in their databases. Um, can somebody speak to that? I don't know if, uh, Colonel Johnson, you want to continue on with this, or if somebody else wants to pick up. But we'll pick well, on you first. <laughs> I'll, I'll take you most of the hook on that. Uh, okay. I think warmly, right? It's a really good question, yes. It's a very good question. And the way that we started electronically to exchange information was with standards like the PDF standard. Uh, and even though it's been enhanced over the years, it's still basically sharing a document between people that need a document. Uh, whereas... So I can type know, a letter, and I can scan it into my computer, and I can share it with you, and right. you will get it. Right now, however, if you wanted a lot of the data that was in that document to show up in your computer database, you'd have to sit there and type it in. And we haven't done very well at, at, at getting uh, electronic documents scanned to store the data. So for example, if a, a police crime report, if police want to send that to the prosecutor or an arrest report, uh, the prosecutor wants that data on who the suspect is and the arrest details and the charges in the prosecutor's computer. They don't want a document, really. They really want it stored so they can then process it and schedule the case and so on. And so there's a whole lot of manual labor that goes on, even with a PDF kind of document, whereas an XML-based information exchange that the data that's already in the police computer on the arrest report can be electronically put into a form in an XML format, and all XML is, is is the actual data itself with some tags around the data that say what the data means. 
And that's how the other computer knows, ah, this is data, this is the last name, this is the arrest charge. I know where to put that in my database in my computer. And now you've completely eliminated that duplicate data entry or in the errors associated with rekeying the data from a document back into another computer. But not only that, once you've built this, if you also want to send that to the courts or to the sheriff or the next police department and have built this capability for exchanges, you can do that if, if everybody's using Neem without creating a whole other new interface. Uh, and Deborah, let, let me add to that. Go ahead. Paul Embley, um, uh, what we're seeing on the court side of the house is that uh, we we have two distinct needs. Um, we absolutely need PDF to preserve the original document so that uh, years down the road we can go back to that and we can refer to the document in its original form uh, with its original signatures and whatnot. But we also uh, see that as a prosecutor brings a case or as uh, self-litigants fill in information that it doesn't make sense for us to rekey all of that information uh, that, uh, that could be had electronically. And so what we are doing is we are um, using XML to obviously bring that information in from an e-filing document or from a uh, police records management system or from a prosecutor's case management system and thereby save resources um, in, in you know, doing all this mundane data entry. And then uh, wanting to contribute to the community as well, uh, we uh, go ahead and we pass that information on to corrections when we sentence an individual, uh, pass information back to uh, uh, the police on disposition data and whatnot. So, which has always been a big problem for the court system in, in knowing the disposition. You get those criminal histories that when I was a deputy prosecutor locally, you know, I, I couldn't even read the things anyway. And, you know, you'd go in to get a guy sentenced and you wouldn't, uh, you wouldn't really be sure you had all the right information about his background. Right. 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 Uh, Another question was asked, actually by the same uh, questioner, uh, um, is there a timetable when all this will be happening? And that's a, that's a pretty interesting question because it really depends on the people attending this this uh, panel discussion and other people around the country. Uh, you know, when everybody's going to start using uh, this approach. Um, another interesting aspect to his question is, would it become a mandatory tool? And I think uh, I think our panelists will agree that this is uh, this is not going to be made mandatory by anybody except the exigencies of the situations that face us. So, would somebody uh, want to speak to that? Well, um, the the design of this data model is truly collaborative, and it's not mandatory, and the you know, the, this is not a federally mandated standard. It's a standard built by collaboration with state and local and federal and industry. However, there is a there is a requirement now under a special condition being put on grants from BJA, from DHS, and the COPS program, all using the same language that say if you're going to take federal money to build something to do with information exchanges, you must conform to the NEEM data model. They're, the federal government's not saying what's in it, but they're saying now that you all have done this, you're going to use it. Right. Yeah. Well, they're just saying if you're going to use our money. I, I know that right. because, of course, <laughs> as, as Paul well knows, I was involved in deciding to uh, uh, go this route. You know, if you're going to use federal money for this, uh, the federal government does want to encourage you uh, to, to right. be uh, collaborative and to exchange data in the most efficient way. So that's why um, uh, they are saying, if you're going to use our money, you need to make sure that it's NEEM compliant. Um, would you say, uh, and I'll ask uh, our practitioners, uh, all of you are, but uh, I'll go back to Colonel Johnson. Uh, from the police agency perspective, um, that if you are engaged in a procurement, uh, isn't one of the first things you want to know whether uh, 
those who are offering you a package uh, are going to offer you something that's NEEM compliant. And how do you do that? Yeah, absolutely. In fact, we're in the midst of um, developing an intelligence system uh, within New York State. And when Global Justice uh, XML came out, uh, that was one of the uh, items that we wrote in to our uh, request for information. And then subsequently, our request for proposal. Uh, as it transitioned to NEEM, uh, fortunately, they're so closely aligned, it really didn't cause an issue at all. Uh, so the company that we're currently de dealing with, um, our system is going to be uh, NEEM compliant. And that's being paid for uh, with money uh, from New York State, so it was not a grant. Uh, yet we recognize the importance of uh, being able to talk to other systems. Uh, however, uh, on the other hand, uh, the recently announced uh, and awarded uh, COPS grant that came out uh, that did s uh, specifically say that it needed to be a NEEM compliant. And as you said, Deborah, that's, that's a good thing um, because we need to set some sort of standard uh, that everybody should be uh, building towards, uh, particularly when it's uh, money that's being passed in a grant uh, proposal. So through the e-justice portal, the intelligence system that's being built, and our ability to connect with the other state systems, county systems, and local systems, uh, we'll be ready also with index uh, later on down the road. So there's a great deal of uh, utility with that. And let me follow on to that. We had a uh, our questioner that was asking us about, um, you know, how does XML really work? And, and we talked about the disparate data systems and connecting them up. Um, still, I think we have uh, confusion about the difference between XML uh, and NEEM. And are, do you use them for different purposes? And I think what you're trying to tell us is that it's actually been an evolution from XML into NEEM. Um, Paul Embley, you've worked a lot on that. Uh, maybe do you want to address that? Well, a, a way to look at it is uh, XML is kind of uh, the, the dictionary or the, the foundation. But NEEM provides the specific uh, vocabulary that we need. Um, uh, there are several countries that speak English throughout the world, but if you look at the way that they string things together, uh, it's quite different, and uh, and even some of the definitions. And so, what we've done, uh, what you have to do with XML is is actually um, customize that to your particular um, uh, organization or your particular discipline. And so with NEEM, what we've done is we've taken XML, which is the foundation, and built the definitions, built the terms so that uh, we all agree on what they mean. So that when we uh, uh, put uh, or transmit a person name that we all understand what that means. And that's, that's pretty easy, but uh, when we get into things uh, such as case, what does that mean? Is that uh, you know a case of beer, or is that a case of uh, a, a court case, or is that a criminal investigation case? And so we've put those definitions in there so that we know exactly what we mean when we say case. So, so you're saying that Neem really takes the data model, the tags that Paul Warmly talked about. Um, that can pull out um, L name means last name, et cetera. And then you've added more texture to this, basically, so that we all agree across the board that if you enter the word case, this is what it means? Yes, and, and, and I think that that brings up a really good point. Um, as much as we would uh, love for uh, technology to stand still and for all of us to catch up to it, uh, you know, we know that that's not going to happen. and so. Um, one of the, the key uh, things when we started this initiative was we said XML is the flavor today and it will be for the next five or ten years, but uh, there are things on the horizon that are being investigated that will replace XML. So what's important to us is that we all agree on what the definitions of these terms are because that will persist. Uh, technology will continue to change, but if we can uh, agree on what these definitions mean, 
then that will persist uh, no matter what te underlying technology we use. And so that was really the focus of what we did and, and I think what we've accomplished for the most part with NEEM. So in other words, while no government agency is mandating that people use this, uh, what really is happening is that uh, the mandate kind of comes from circumstances that if you don't get on board here, you're just going to be left behind in terms of your ability uh, to share this kind of information. Well, and that's true. And I, I will, uh, you know, sing some praises for Paul Warmly and what he's done for the industry. But uh, we we have uh, vendors who have made uh, full scale commitments to implementing this at no cost. And if you don't want to use NEEM uh, to do your information exchanges, then they will uh, charge you for those uh, custom-made ex uh, extensions. And uh, a customization like that usually starts at $75,000 and goes up. And so I think the that... Uh, would seem pretty simple. <laughs> I, I, I think that would be absolutely correct. <laughs> well, and, and that leads to a question that always uh, is of interest uh, uh, to anybody involved uh, in really any enterprise, and that is um, what kind of cost savings, actual savings, are available, not just avoidance of costs, but what kind of cost savings can be available through using NEEM, and can you explain how that can be? I don't know who wants to take that one. Well, I'll, I'll, start, I'll start with that. Uh, oh, okay, great. The, the cost savings come you know, if you're if you're a district attorney to put you in your old job, uh, Deborah, and you you wanted to build an exchange with the courts to exchange data, odds are you're going to hire a contractor to come in and do that for you, and they're going to give you a quote. And if you used if you did this the old-fashioned way, they'd probably come in and tell you that it's like 250000 to 500000 to build that kind of extensive interface you want with the courts. But if both parties are committed to using NEEM, that cost will be cut by 75%. And, uh, and, and instead of 500000 it'll cost you 100000 And generally speaking, across the board, that's what you see? Yeah. Uh, it, we had a very interesting study in the, in the European Union adopted the GGXTM to uh, exchange warrant information and in, you know across 22 different countries with 26 different languages and they decided to use the GGXTM and they have testified that it cut their cost at least in half and cut in half the time it took to do that to build that capability to exchange warrant information across those all the countries in the European Union. And in, in Missouri, the courts used the uh, GGXDM to bring data from local courts to the to the state, and their own analysis says they saved about 1.6 million dollars using GGXDM over what they would have had to spend had they not used the standard. Well, and so not only is there a cost savings, it sounds like uh, when you're constructing your system. Uh, but then, in, just in terms of doing your day-to-day -day job, there's a cost saving. Oh yeah, if, particularly if you've automated the process using the and you are able to do the things that Paul was mentioning earlier, and then, and I was also about eliminating redundant data entry. You're saving, and and that could be considered cost avoidance. But uh, you know, there's been a lot of people who have been able to take to reduce jobs in police departments and courts and prosecutors and use those that headcount for other functions rather than duplicate data entry. Or for that matter, you know, with uh, with law enforcement, you're probably talking about more hours on the street, less hours doing reports. Correct. Some of those kinds of things. That's correct. And there's also a timeliness issue here that we 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 all know how important it is that this information be shared in a timely fashion. If you're going to prevent future criminal or terrorist acts, you can't wait for this to take a, the course it does in a manual transmission. You know, we've notoriously in this country we've set up situations where the court, the judge issues a warrant, 
and it's printed out manually in, in the court system, and it may be Friday afternoon, and you know the person who takes the mail over to the police department doesn't get around to it until the next week, and by then that person that, for whom the warrant was issued has killed three more people. Whereas if the information was electronically exchanged, and the police had that in their mobile computers in their car to know when they stopped that person that he was wanted for homicide, uh, you might have avoided those deaths. Absolutely. So there are human cost savings uh, as well as dollar cost savings, and that's uh, what law enforcement is about anyway. Right. Um, someone has asked the question, uh, how does the system become NEEM compliant? Is there somebody out there who certifies that it's NEEM compliant? Uh, not, not really. There, are, There's a, a set of rules on the website, on the OJP website and the NEEM website about what it means to be NEEM conformant. And it's really pretty simple. It, there's a set of naming and design rules for how you name data. and. It, you know, the, the conformance says that if you're building one of these exchanges in your jurisdiction, don't reinvent the wheel. Use what's already in NEAM. Don't create a new data component that overlaps what's already there. And if you want to add something new, just add, add it in accordance with the naming and design rules, and then you're going to be conforming. And but so, there isn't any certification process. OK. So if. Um you know, if Paul Embley is is looking as the CIO for his uh, organization, um, he is looking to put out uh, some sort of an RFP, uh, and somebody comes in and says, "Well, yes, what we're going to construct for you is NEEM compliant." How does he know? Well, that's a that's one that actually Deborah, we've been uh, um, struggling with, and is on our plate. Um, and one of the things that we are doing from the court's perspective is figuring out how it is that we're going to uh, give some assurance to any of our, our uh, community, uh, any members of our community, that something that they're buying uh, is at least somewhat uh, likely to meet their needs, especially in, in information exchanges. And so that is an issue that we're tackling not only from the court's perspective, but I, I know that we have a couple partners in trying to tackle that. And so uh, we, we are doing that. There, the other thing that I would mention is that um, the courts uh, has, uh, we have a website where we actually public, uh, publish specifications for uh, how a court case management system should function, and in addition to that functionality, what those IEPDs should be that are included in that. Um, I know that uh, um, the law enforcement has that same thing through the LEADS Council, and, and uh, if there's interest in uh, finding out more on that, I, I believe that uh, Paul actually has a, a technical assistance slide that he could put up on how to get uh, technical assistance. Yeah, do you, Paul, have such a slide handy? Uh, well, the, if you go to the IGIS website, there's a tab called technical assistance that uh, you can just click on and read about it. Oh, good. So you go to, uh, I know we had some of those, uh, some of those sites up earlier. Um, Jim, have you got that list of Jim, do you have the links? Uh, yes, can you uh, repeat that website again, please? Uh, www.igis.org. Oh, there we go. Um, yeah, this is the. Oh, there's the, the link, the list of links that you have. And that, that has the links that Paul mentioned to the LEADS website as well as the IGIS Institute. If you click yeah. on that one right there, and you'll see over at the left a a uh, set of menu buttons, and there's one called Technology Assistance, and you just can go there and read about how to apply and get help. And when you mentioned LEETS, which is the Law Enforcement Information Technology Standards Council, um, that's that's uh, yet another uh, place that you mentioned that people can go. Uh, and that one, Jim, as you may have found it by now, www.leits.com. Uh, there it is. 
Technology mm -hmm. Standards Council. Um, and, and Jim, are you going to uh, have all of this posted after this concludes, so it'll be on the website and people can find these links? Yep, that's correct. It's on the event page uh, under the link title resources. And uh, anyone who registered, I'll send information out how to get to this and to the recording and presenter slides. Good. Um, I know that uh, Colonel Johnson had talked during his remarks about how important uh, the, the duality of approach is. And this is something that I feel pretty strongly about, too. And I wondered if we could go back to that. But um, when we were talking about cost savings, for example, um, you know, you've got a lot, of, uh, a lot of law enforcement agencies and a lot of uh, court systems and others who um, don't necessarily think that their town is the next terror target. Uh, but uh, you can serve two purposes uh, with this approach, correct, uh, Colonel Johnson? Yes, um, I, I won't speak to the technical aspect. I'll just talk to the operational aspect. Um, law enforcement, um, when we ask them to uh, fight terrorism or fight crime, um, quite frankly, we're not asking them to um, discern a difference between the two because an individual who may be um, at a street corner uh, taking photographs of a, of a bank uh, within a community, uh, we don't expect that officer to know whether or not that individual is taking pictures for a terrorist attack or if they're going to be uh, committing a bank robbery. Uh, but certainly what we want them to do is approach that individual, uh, reasonable suspicion, uh, ask uh, some questions, make some observations, and if they do believe that it's uh, suspicious, their activity, uh, we would expect them to report it and to report it to their supervisors, to report it to uh, an intelligence center uh, where that information can be received, uh, can be databased, can be analyzed to really try to determine whether or not it is criminal related uh, for a, a bank robbery or criminally related to a terrorist attack that's shared uh, with the FBI. But the important thing with the duality of the approach is that uh, through NEEM, uh, the systems um, that are being built, the information that is being exchanged uh, is going to serve uh, both purposes. So I do understand that some people believe that um, a terrorist attack or planning may not um, occur um, within their jurisdiction, which it could very well be, but more often than not, that, that law enforcement executive um, is being asked about the robberies, uh, the burglaries, and the homicides. Uh, that are being committed within that jurisdiction. Um, so through this, uh, the NEEM process, uh, we're going to be able to serve uh, both functions very well, I believe. Uh, great. And I'll, I'll continue to welcome our uh, audience questions. We're monitoring to see if you ask us any questions. And um, uh, Jim, do you want to uh, remind people how they go about doing that for one second here? Sure. Um, to ask a question, you go to the question and answer window, which is at the bottom left side of your screen, and then click on the bottom field in that window and type your question, and then click Ask. Then you, uh, and then I will see it, and uh, Jim will see it, and we'll, uh, we'll, we'll be sure to pose it to our panelists. Let me uh, uh, ask, too, uh, someone had mentioned uh, Fusion centers, uh, uh, criminal justice information fusion, intelligence fusion centers, and I'm not sure everybody has a in this broad audience has a grasp of that. But um, does anybody want to talk a little bit? And maybe that's another uh, Bart Johnson issue. Uh, you know, how does this how does this kind of approach help the fusion centers? Sure. Um, obviously, after September 11th, um, there was a real need, an identified need, and really urgency to uh, share information. So a number of uh, state and local law enforcement agencies started to build um, intelligence centers. And within New York State, we have the uh, New York State uh, Intelligence Center. And that literally was a uh, ground up uh, approach to information sharing within uh, New York State. And concurrent with that, and really unbeknownst to us, 
uh, other states and jurisdictions were doing exactly the same thing, building uh, intelligence centers slash fusion centers within their particular jurisdiction. And then fortunately, the International Association of Chiefs of Police uh, sponsored an intelligence summit. And it was at that summit that they created the uh, Criminal Intelligence Coordinating Council. And that uh, council is made up of uh, state police agencies, sheriffs, and local law enforcement um, to include tribal uh, officers. And at those venues, uh, we began to develop a plan uh, to interconnect uh, all of those intelligence centers. And through interactions we had with the FBI, Department of Homeland Security, uh, Department of Defense, uh, they joined us in a, in a true partnership and that led to uh, the information sharing environment on uh, the implementation plan uh, that was sponsored by Ambassador McNamara. And contained within the information sharing environment are five specific guidelines uh, within there. Uh, one has to do with uh, information sharing amongst the fusion centers. And the other um, one of the five had to do uh, with the technology involving information sharing. So they fully endorse a NEAM. Now what does it mean to a fusion center? What it means to a fusion center is a, a state trooper or a deputy or a street cop uh, stops an individual, scans his license uh, with a data scanner, or may have been involved in an accident, uh, communicates that information to the Department of Motor Vehicles. Uh, that information gets to uh, communicated through the National Criminal uh, Information uh, Center, NCIC, uh, where he may receive a hit from the terror screening center. Uh, that information is uh, subsequently passed through a field interview card to a fusion center, uh, where at those fusion centers right now are sitting representatives from state, local, FBI, Department of Homeland Security, and in some areas, Department of Defense. So they too have all their own information centers. So what I think, what I know NEAM is going to be able to do is to uh, interconnect those systems uh, according to very specific business protocols, procedures, privacy, security, and make those exchanges uh, timely, relevant, and possibly uh, reduce crime, prevent a terrorist attack. Uh, so we're very much looking forward to uh, this being built out and excited to see where it's going to bring us next. Uh, which leads to a question. Uh, relating to something that uh, Paul Embley said um, on the subject of other agencies. Transportation was one that you mentioned. And I think you later uh, mentioned HHS as well. Um, what's the benefit, for example, um, if you're in the courts or you're in law enforcement, um, what's the benefit of getting transportation folks um, able to share information with you and vice versa? Just, just from an operational perspective, um, as you get uh, threats coming in or um, if a particular event is going to be occurring, you need to get that information out to hospitals, uh, first responders to include uh, fire departments, uh, Department of Transportation. Um, and they have their own requirements and their own systems. And conversely, uh, we're building a relationship like many er other areas in the country to uh, receive those uh, information streams, whether it's a threat, um, a, a suspicious activity that's observed um, with those private entities into the fusion center. So that's really where it's uh, fused all together and create the report. So, and, and the same thing holds true with emergency management. Um, a lot of the fusion centers have emergency managers sitting there side by side with them uh, should, should an incident occur uh, that's man-made or one that's naturally made. Uh, in the form of a hurricane or tornado. Uh, so they're critical partners. They need to be sitting there at the table with us. And they need the information uh, just as much as uh, uh, we do. Um, so I believe that NEAM will be very helpful in that regard, too, as we cross their systems. Which leads to a question for Paul Wormley. Uh, we have a questioner from our audience saying, uh, can you talk about data security uh, regarding the exchange of sensitive, personally identifiable data, um, you know, are we are we far enough down the road with this? Are there standards for privacy and security? I think actually all of you could speak to this, but anyone can jump in. 
Well, uh, since you started with me, I'll start. <laughs> you picked on me. I think there there are a lot of standards already developed for privacy and security. There, uh, this is not a new topic to the law enforcement community. We've been working on these issues for you know 40 years that I know of, and uh, there are international standards for privacy. There are uh, privacy guidelines for fusion centers. There was a summit meeting a couple of years ago that developed recommendations for privacy. Global has a uh, security publication and privacy publication. If you go to the ojp.it.gov uh, website, you can find uh, references to all the documents that are that have been published. Yeah, what um, do you say that between those two websites, I guess, the it.ojp.gov um, and the NEEM website, um, you would get a lot of those standards or maybe all of them? Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, we, we, one of the things that's, um, we're, we're very sensitive in this community to issues of, of PII, personal identifying information, and in the development of the specification for the suspicious activity report that involved fusion centers and uh, directors from around the country and Wells technologists, uh, the states uh, basically said that they wanted to create two different versions of of the SAR, as it's called, one with PII and one without. And they were generally of a mind to keep the one that had the PII internal to the state and not share it even with the federal agencies. And except in Intel, there was justification to do so. So uh, those, uh, and we've also built into into not just to NEEM, but the architecture that supports implementation of NEEM, which is called the Justice Reference Architecture. A lot of uh, characteristics of security and, and privacy, and we've been, we've held numerous meetings on how technology can help implement privacy policy. It's still up to the federal government on the one hand and, and state attorneys general on the other hand to set policies and, and legislators on federal state levels on uh, privacy policy but we're ready to implement the on the technology side those rules as fast as they're created or modified in accordance with state law and federal law. So it's certainly capable of being done it's just a matter of um, those who have the authority to do that, deciding what the rules are. Yes. Right. And, and and much progress has been made in that, but there's still ways to go. And one of the things that uh, BJA is currently helping individual fusion centers develop uh, privacy impact assessments for everything they're doing. And it gets a little trickier when you talk about intelligence information, once information becomes intelligence as a result of analysis or something, then it's governed by the Code of Federal Regulations that has to be taken into account. Uh, and, and more scrutiny and, and better handling has to be applied. Uh, but like I said, those are, those are not new issues. Uh, and there's an enormous body of literature out there that, in fact, if, uh, if anybody wants to wants more detail on it that you can go to those websites and just search on those terms you'll find an enormous amount of stuff. Yeah, maybe we could talk just for a minute here uh, about uh, the human element of all this. I mean th as you said these have always been issues whether we were automated or not um, that we had to be careful with that information. Um, how, how much does automation exacerbate those issues and or solve them um, don't you still need people thinking through those issues carefully and then deciding what their own standards for privacy are going to be so that they will be compliant with these rules? In other words, um, the people responsible for operations versus the people they hire perhaps to put in a system. Well, you're absolutely right. It, it takes that personal thoughtfulness or, or corporate thoughtfulness, if you will, to think through the, the needs. Uh, you know, the, the Supreme Court has, has held on a couple of occasions that there's a difference between automated collections of data and manual collections, and particularly with respect to court records. Uh, 
there's several decisions that, that say that there is more exposure once the data is automated because there's this principle that it, it takes too much effort to go get a manual copy of, of an individual case record and, and, and it's not aggregated like one typically does with a computer. So uh, you have to think those things through. I and mean, people, you know, in, in some states in their eagerness in the early days uh, published data, for example, with social security numbers. Now no one would think of doing that on the web. Uh, and but you have to think through those data elements, and that's why the, the the rules for privacy impact assessment are so important because that's the framework within which you think through what you're doing with personal identifying information. And you can actually, when you say privacy impact assessment, you can actually get if you're a practitioner out there. Um, some assistance with how to conduct a privacy impact assessment? Yes, there is technical assistance available from a number of sources. There's also guidelines published by Global that are on the on the uh, OJP website, um, uh, security guidelines for fusion centers and privacy guidelines for fusion centers that that lay out uh, there's templates available that you can you can get as well as technical assistance. Okay, thank you. Um, we we also have uh, a question about the uh, uh, the common agreements on data fields. Um, people would like some kind of models of um, such agreements. Uh, are there models available? Are there documents available that are sort of a template for what people in the field need in order to? I think what we're talking about here is. Um, uh, is entering into agreements uh, not only with other agencies in terms of sharing, but also uh, with private vendors in terms of developing uh, a system. It, are there any templates that people can use? And where will they find them? De there are Deborah, some. Deborah, all those things are available on the OJP website uh, through the Fusion Center guidelines. And, and in fact, on the Fusion Center guidelines, there's a considerable amount of uh, Material and documentation, and go to Paul's uh, point about the privacy privacy impact assessment. Uh, that's something that's being addressed very, very aggressively through um, the National Fusion Center Coordination Group of the FBI and DHS, and also the CICC, uh, because we all recognize the importance of um, paying attention to it and not allowing any gaps to occur. And as it relates to um, policies, they're in, they're in place, and generally they're similar. And as you well know, uh, 28 CFR Part 23 uh, rules um, the manner in which material is stored. It has to reach that reasonable suspicion uh, level to be stored within a, a system that's paid for by the federal government. But I think what uh, many people are gratified to know is that even systems that aren't paid for by the federal government, uh, 28 CFR Part 23 has become the de facto uh, benchmark for retaining information. And that is very much a good thing. So there's a lot of material contained on that website uh, to include MOUs, uh, relationships with other agencies, uh, privacy impact assessments. So I encourage uh, the people who are listening to this uh, call to uh, uh, research it and look at it. And that's again at the it.ojp.gov website? Yes, ma'am. OK, great. Um, we have another question that I think I'm just going to read uh, directly. Uh, sharing of mug shots, crime scene images, et cetera, seems to be in high demand, uh, which is currently being handled via PDFs with emailing uh, with the names concept. Passing of this type of information will be the way to go to repositories state systems and national, is that correct? So in other words, I think we're saying um, now instead of just passing along uh, you know, a PDF uh, of a mugshot or another image, um, you'll be able to reach into other databases. I think that is our question. Um, there are actually, this is Paul Embley, um, there are actually a, a few uh, projects that are being worked on right now. Um, there's one project, uh, uh, I know the project name is Surfers and it involves San Diego, Alaska, um, Arizona to pass mugshots and uh, other photos 
back and forth because they're finding that criminals don't stop at state borders or even at international borders. And so, strangely enough, eh? <laughs> yeah, strangely enough, um, and uh, they've had quite some success in being able to pass uh, those kinds of information. So we're not limited to just the text-based information any longer, uh, as you point out. And so. Um, I think you'll see more and more of this go. Now, um, one of the things that I think we continue to recognize is that uh, states uh, make up their own laws and uh, their own uh, regulations. And so uh, being able to freely pass this kind of information is subject to which states uh, are trying to do this, uh, which agreements are in place. And so one of the things that we're finding is that technology is uh, outpacing policy decisions in many and statutes in many instances. And so uh, before we uh, go off and build this utopian system where we'll be passing all kinds of uh, uh, personal information across, uh, we need to have those privacy impact assessments, but we also need to work uh, to ensure that civil liberties aren't violated, but at the same time that uh, uh, the information gets to the right person so that they can make uh, life-saving decisions uh, at the right time. Absolutely, uh, which sounds uh, a bit like something of a wrap-up comment, but I want to ask our other speakers as well, since we have just a few minutes left, um, any other uh, uh, parting comments that you think uh, raise critical issues or that maybe answer critical questions people still may have out there? Um, Colonel Johnson, turn to you. I really have nothing to add other than to say uh, thank you uh, very much, and, and I'll be able to uh, post uh, my uh, PowerPoint on the web so you have my permission to do that. Great. And uh, Paul Wormley? Uh, likewise with mine. I, I would like to suggest to those of you that want to learn more about NEEM that you go to www.neem.gov and go down to the bottom of the first page, and then you can click on a, a little button that says uh, sign up for the email. We put out this thing called Neem News on a, every couple of weeks to j just give you highlights of the latest stories of what the status is and stories about adoption and use. And uh, It's all done automatically. It's just pushed out to you so it doesn't, we try not to clutter your inbox with a lot of stuff, but it, it keeps you up to speed on what's going on and it's openly available to anybody on the line. Great, thanks. And and Paul Embley, any, one more uh, comment? Anything else? Um, we really look forward to having uh, your IEPDs posted out there so that we can see them. Well, thank you. And uh, before I turn this back over to Jim Cooney to close us out, uh, let me just add uh, my thanks, and I will uh, thank you on behalf of our audience as well who can't speak uh, to you. Uh, to our very distinguished panel, Colonel Bart Johnson, Paul Embley, and Paul Wormley, uh, for adding a great deal of light uh, to this subject uh, for our audience today. Uh, and again, it is just one of the most important things that I think that people in the criminal justice system uh, and related to it in any way can be concentrating on right now. Uh, our thanks as well, of course, to uh, Harvard, the Kennedy School, and also the National Institute of Justice, who partners with Harvard uh, and the Kennedy School to put on uh, these programs. So we're most grateful to them. Uh, I'll add another compliment to the Bureau of Justice Assistance, who has done so much to further this effort. Uh, and uh, thank our audience for uh, sticking with us uh, during the course of a, a lengthy session. Uh, Jim, let me turn it over to you to close this out. Thank you, Deborah. And uh, I'll just uh, also say thanks to uh, you and to our panel for a great event. Uh, thanks especially. We were dealing with some broadband issues there, and I appreciate you uh, working through it very gracefully, I might add. And uh, just a reminder to our audience, um, if you registered with us, we'll be in, be in touch when the recording of this event is posted, as well as uh, the presenter's slides. And of course, the websites that we're looking at are already available on our event page, which uh, you should have the link to already. And um, you just scroll down to the resources link and click that, and you'll get that whole list of resources. Thanks again, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.